In this video, we'll be looking at complex zeros and the fundamental theorem of algebra. What is the fundamental theorem of algebra? This says that if you have a polynomial function of degree n, it will have n complex zeros. Some of them real, some of them may be non-real, and some of them can be repeated. Basically, what it means is if I have f of x is equal to 3x to the cubed plus 2x squared minus 4x plus 17, this is my degree, it's the third degree, I will have three zeros, meaning I can f factor it into three factors, and there may be a coefficient in front. We talked in the last video about equivalent statements with real numbers. Now we have some equivalent statements with complex numbers. Reminder that a complex number is going to have a real portion and an imaginary portion. So with complex numbers, if k is, an, is a complex number, then you can say that as a solution or a root, you can say that it is a zero of the, of the function, and you can say that x minus k is a factor. Now, in the previous video with real numbers, we had a fourth one that said that k was an x-intercept. So, why isn't k an x-intercept? Because k is complex, it has an imaginary portion, and on our our Cartesian coordinate system here, these are all real numbers. We do not have an imaginary portion on this graph, and so the imaginary part will not be intersecting the x-axis. To show you an example of this, if we have a function here, we want to write it in standard form, meaning we want to multiply it out. So for multiplying this, we have x times x is x squared. Because we have a, a positive and a negative, the outer and the inner terms will cancel out. And then we will have a minus 9 times i squared gives us a plus 9. So f of x equals x squared plus 9. So the roots on this our x equals 3i and x equals negative 3i. Those are the zeros of the f function. And because they are imaginary numbers, there are no x-intercepts of that graph. Talk a little bit about complex conjugate zeros. If we have a complex conjugate, which is something in this form, a plus bi, if that is a zero, then a minus zi is also a zero. Complex conjugates come in pairs. If we have a plus bi, we'll also have a minus bi as a zero. So to use that information, if we are given zeros, of a function, and we're, this is not all of the zeros, the zeros include these, we can find the function from that. So we know that x minus 3 is a 0, so we're going to get x plus 3 as a factor. 3 minus i will give us x minus 3 minus i, and it will also give us x minus, this minus stays there, 3 plus i. And again with the 2. So moving down here, these are all factors. We have x minus 2 plus 5i and its complex conjugate pair, x minus 2 minus 5i. Notice that the minus sign for the x doesn't change. It's the plus and the minus within 
the complex number that changes. Now, once we have this, we can multiply it all out. Let me clear this off and show you. So now that I've written this out, let me show you how to simplify it. We're going to work with the complex numbers first, so we'll leave this x minus 3, and we're going to start off with this pair first. So we can rewrite this as x minus 3 plus i and x minus 3 minus i. I have distributed this negative here, so that's why the signs changed. I can factor out the x minus 3. Sorry, I'm not factoring out, I'm actually multiplying. So it's x minus 3 times x minus 3 is x squared, x minus 3 squared. My middle terms will cancel out and then I'll have minus i squared. Let's use all this information to factor a polynomial. We're going to write f of x equals 3x to the fifth plus x to the fourth minus 24x to the third minus 8x squared minus 27x minus 9 as a product of linear and irreducible quadratic factors, each with real coefficients. Step one is to identify all of the potential zeros. We're going to look at the factors of 9, which would be plus and minus 1, plus and minus 3, plus and minus 9, and that will be over the factors of 3, which are plus and minus 1 and plus and minus 3. So that will give us, plus and minus 1 would give us all of those, and the 3 will give us plus and minus 1 third. So those are all the potential zeros. Our next step is to graph it. I'm entering it into the graphing calculator here. So in this we're not really concerned with what the maximum, maximum and minimum are on the y's, we're concerned with the zeros. So looking at our zeros here, we had potential of 1, 1 third, 3, and 9. So if we zoom in a little bit here, Let's make our window on the x's negative 3, positive 3. We can see that negative 3 and positive 3 look good and, and the negative 1 third looks good. So let's try our synthetic division and see what we get. So I'll just start with 3, which gives us 3, 1, negative 24, negative 8, negative 27, negative 9. Bring down the 3, 3 times 3 is 9, 10, 30, 6, 18, 10, 30, 3, 9, and 0. So 3 is a factor. So that leaves us with x minus 3 times 3x to the fourth plus 10x to the third plus 6x squared plus 10x plus 3. So let's try our negative 3. 3 times negative 3 is negative 10. 1, negative 3, 3, negative 9, 1, and negative 3, and 0. Moving on to clearing off the page here, we were left with x 
minus 3, x plus 3, and 3x squared, that was 3x to the third, plus x squared, plus 3x plus 1. So we have one more left, and that is x, the 1 third. From our graph, it was negative 1 third, so we've got 3, 1, 3, 1. Three times negative one third is negative one, and three times negative one third is negative one again. So now we've graphed this down to, we factored it down to x minus three, x plus three, x plus one third, and 3x squared plus 3. 3x squared plus 3 can be factored. We can factor out the 3. And we can also use this 3 here to take care of the 1 third. So we have x minus 3, x plus 3, 3x plus 1. And then the x squared plus 1 can be factored into x plus i and x minus i. I. And now we've, we've factored that entire function. And now I leave you just for fun. See you in class.